This podcast is brought to you by Vinzero. Vinzero pioneers solutions and services to the AEC and manufacturing industries to support net zero targets. Visit vinzero.com to learn more about how organisations design, build and solve through digitalisation. From Vinzero to you, welcome to our Think Future podcast series. Each week, we'll share conversations with industry leaders from around the world to find out how they're thinking future. In this episode of our Think Future series, we're sharing conversations first with Lisa Stein for Autodesk on the role of technology in reshaping construction practices, and then Peter DeMarca, NTD Paints, joins us to talk about how they're changing the way we see paint. With a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Science and Technology, Lisa Stein spent almost a decade in the electric utility industry, focusing heavily on the design and analysis of high voltage power lines and the direct management of those projects from construction to closeout. Upon leaving the engineering world, she joined Autodesk to further her expertise in the landscape of engineering and construction technology. Today, working with Autodesk construction partners in the marketing space, Lisa is focused on creating a one-team community for all Autodesk customers. She's passionate about the many opportunities in the construction space and is a big believer in engineering sustainability to not only drive better business, but also to create a better world. Welcome to the program, Lisa. Thank you so much for having me. Lisa, perhaps let's just start by sharing a snapshot of your professional background and the journey to lead Autodesk Construction Solutions business. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So I started my career as a structural engineer. I spent about 10 years in the electric delivery and transmission industry. So I did a lot of high voltage power line design, some substation design, and just a lot of analysis of existing lines, making sure that clearances were met and, um, you know, that we weren't no power was going to be lost in the process of of our day-to-day life. So I did that for about 10 years, also spent a lot of time out in the field doing construction in that space too, supervising a lot of projects, and then decided that I wanted to make a move. So I moved into sales, where I was still focused on the electric utility world. I was helping to bring on new solutions to electric distribution and transmission customers. So that was really interesting and, and unique to kind of get to leverage my, uh, my engineering and, and professional background in that capacity. We did that for a bit and made a transition over to Autodesk doing really the same thing, right? Continuing to work with our electric distribution and transmission customers over on the design side of Autodesk. Was there for a couple of years and then decided I'd like to kind of go back into consulting and and rewiring solutionizing for customers. So I made a move into a technical solutions executive role on our construction side of the business. So I worked in, uh, in, in a global role doing that, really enjoyed that, really enjoyed kind of getting getting back in there with engineering and putting myself back in the in the designer and the in the engineer role a little bit was there for a couple of years and then decided you know I really miss working with our partners our partners our our feet on the street. They help get our platform out there and and educate our customers and prospects. And so it's a a space that I I saw a lot of opportunity in and really wanted to leverage my background there. So moved into partner marketing and I've been here for about a year. Wow, that's quite a journey. So Autodesk have recently embraced the cloud for collaboration across the construction industry, haven't they? What can you share about that journey? Yeah, that's another great question. So we have made a series of acquisitions in the past couple of years. Many of you are probably aware and familiar of those things, really starting with Plan Grid. Um, But we realized that working on just a desktop environment is very siloed. It doesn't give us the opportunity to really work as a team and collaborate. And again, going back to my time in the engineering world, I think often of how I would be in the field and it would take a really long time for us to get updated and relevant information from those folks that are working in the office. So Autodesk has really put a big focus on working in the cloud to connect that entire project lifecycle journey, right? All the way from design to project turnover uh, and operations. And it's well known the construction industry is responsible for more than 30% of global carbon emission production. And there's a lot of talk, as you know, about the need to embrace technology if we are going to reduce that position. What's your view on how technology can help with your experience? Yeah, so 
you know, we really talk about digitization and digitization is helping to connect again, all of the different phases of a project. So with that effort, we're able to reduce silos. We're able to reduce effort. We're able to reduce a lot of the back and forth and redundancies we see. We're able to reduce, you know, going way over on our budget or our schedule. Um, and we're also able to reduce our menial task load. So we can also increase the visibility of a project and control who sees various stages in there. All of that helps to just, again, solidify the project and keep it a lot tighter so that we're not having a lot of waste in there. Again, we're not having a lot of back and forth. We're making sure that everybody is on the same page. We're not doing those redundant efforts and, and kind of wasting a lot of time there. It, with that, we're increasing that collaboration that we see. There's also the advantage of data insight. So having visibility into a project helps us to understand if we're on track with a project or if we're falling behind. Again, if there's a lot of issues or redundancies, and even with insights, we can get really specific as to what types of issues com are coming up. So maybe there's a lot of issues in terms of material ordering or maybe our subcontractors aren't communicating properly and they're kind of working over each other, which in turn is causing a lot of rework. When we have project insight and that visibility into what's going on with the project as a whole, we can cut back a lot of that noise and we can make sure that things are a lot tighter and a lot more seamless. And obviously beyond the application of insight, there's a health and safety benefit as well. Absolutely. So, you know, going back to my experience as an engineer and working in the power delivery space, that's historically a very dangerous space to work in. We're putting people on oftentimes power lines that are still live, right, that have a lot of voltage going through them, or we're having to go into substations where, you know, those substations are live too. And, and I'm sure that, you know, some folks have seen videos where substations have just blown up. It's not a very safe environment. So if we are you know, utilizing things like drones or we're utilizing things like 3D scanners and we can put those machines on those sites instead of sending people in there, we're able to do, you know, more high risk work without putting people in those high risk situations. And then, of course, let's go to post-construction because there are some real wins there in extending the life of the data, the life of those in insights to better manage the life cycle of the asset. Tell us a little bit about that. That's a really big point. So as my uh, during my time as a technical solutions executive, a lot of what I heard from owners is that we're spending a lot of money trying to compile all of the information once a project is over. And so if we're working on a project from start to finish in the same space, then we're compiling consistently project information again from start to finish. So this means that we're looking at things like a record of our materials. We're looking at when um, machinery was last updated or looked at, we have a complete audit trail of all of that. And so when we think about handing the project, handing the keys of a facility over to an owner, they have all of that historical information and they're not going to see the typical amount of spend that they have to put in there to get all that information and appropriately run their facility. Okay, so are we talking there about the concept then of a digital twin? And if so, how do you describe a digital twin? Yeah, so we're beginning to talk about the concept of a digital twin, right? We're looking at grabbing all of that information from the project. But in addition, a digital twin is essentially real-time data from an asset that we're layering over simulation data and using then machine learning to help understand what's happening or what can happen within the asset. So when we are managing the information in, in the project lifecycle, as the project is active, we're grabbing that historical information, right? That live information will then turn into historical information just to understand kind of how everything was built out. But then on top of that, we can utilize a digital twin on top of that historical information to put in different simulations to say, if we do X, Y, and Z, how does this machinery respond? And also to glean information, like when will we have to do machinery updates to be more proactive so that we're not waiting for things to kind of fail on a project site, we're having a good understanding of what might fail or what might need maintenance coming up. We can be proactive around that. And that keeps us from things getting shut down and work stopping because we're on the proactive end of that. So when we talk about digital twins and considering your industry experience and knowledge, where would you say the market is at the moment in terms of uptake? 
and what can be done to improve the amount of organisations that are choosing to use data after construction? Great question. So the market is still very new, in my opinion, in this regard. And that's because, again, historically, we have not been giving owners all of the information from the project from start to finish so that they can build out this digital twin. As we look at more of these cloud-based collaborative solutions, we are providing them that turnkey information where they can see what the project was doing back at the beginning. So we're starting to see an uptick in the digital twin space, but there's a lot of opportunity for growth there in my opinion. Now, if you have a project that maybe wasn't handed to you in that capacity, things like insights can be really helpful because they can tell us how other projects kind of functioned during the project and after. And we can then glean that information to kind of think ahead and use it to interpret how our current project might act in the future. And that's a really great way to start to build out a digital twin from that stance too. So beyond the concept of digital twins, what are some of the other technologies changing the face of construction as you see it? Definitely AI, things like machine learning, again, 3D scanners, printers, putting drones out on the site. Something I'm really passionate about is making sure that our workers and our laborers are getting home safely every night. So I think that there's a big uptick in these types of technologies because people want to be safe and people also don't want to spend their time doing something where they could potentially get hurt when they can use their background and their experience doing something else or kind of going into a more um, creative part of the project. So thinking about the construction side of the future, if technology has the ability to reshape that as more owners and developers adopt it, what do you think the construction sites of the future will look like? Well, I think we're going to have a much more empowered workforce with an enhanced ability to focus energy on the creative elements of design. If we look at what buildings looked like 100 years ago versus what they look like today, they're much more complex. They're much more creative. There's a lot more going into the design. And that takes a really skilled workforce. So by using technology, we can kind of walk away from the more menial tasks, as I mentioned earlier, and spend that time on really constructing something very unique unique and and very profound. We also have an ability to reduce frustration through the utilization of things like AI and machine learning, because those are there to support and enhance decision making. And they even can help to predict and solve problems before they occur, as I mentioned with um, with the digital twin space. We're also going to have more efficient construction processes without the recurrence of redundant practices. And that, again, goes back into the cloud and collaboration space. We're reducing redundancies because we're all working together and have real-time insight into what's going on at every phase of the project. I think we'll also see additional efficiencies in terms of project completion because we'll have less waste and that in turn will create more profitability. And the last thing I can really think of is, you know, it's going to be better for our stakeholders and just overall better for the environment. So what are the drivers accelerating digitalization across the sector, Lisa? So we've got supply chain demands and disruptions such as the pandemic, right, with COVID. And who knows, you know, there's there's going to be more disruptions like that, too. We're in California. There's tons of wildfires. There's just a lot of things that are kind of unknown and unpredictable. But those types of events can absolutely create a bottleneck in terms of getting materials and resources on site to a project. We also have a high number of projects with reduced resources available, both in terms of materials and in human resources to deliver those. So that kind of goes back to the supply chain issue, but also we don't have a tremendous amount of people in the construction space anymore. And we need to attract along those lines, we need to attract and retain a changing workforce as the new generations become the future. So I remember as an engineer in the electrical industry, you know, when I came in, there were the people that were almost retiring and then there was nobody in the middle and then there was the younger workforce. So it's really, really important that we pull in younger folks because we are starting to see a lot of retirements happen. And it's also on that note, really important to be utilizing technology as we know that the younger generation is really attached to technology in all kinds of regards. And that's going to make this industry a really attractive one for this younger generation. So Lisa, with so many compelling reasons to adopt digitalization, why is the industry holding back? People are hesitant to add more work to their current workloads. When we think of adopting a new solution or doing things differently, we think, well, I already have to do the work that I'm doing and I'm going to have to learn how to do something else and I don't want to do that. 
There's also a fear of interruption to projects. So if we're working on something and we already have deadlines, we don't want to bring on a new solution, which could, you know, in our minds, potentially disrupt the work that we're doing. And we might have to take a, a couple of steps back. So those are two thoughts that I think show up a lot um, in terms of people not wanting to adopt new processes. There's also a comfort with what we've been doing, right? The way that construction has been done has been the same for a very, very long time. And so doing something different, adopting new processes can feel really scary to people. And with that, there's just a fear of change. It's an unknown. What does it look like? Am I positive that it's going to provide me with, you know, with positive outcomes? Am I sure that it's going to be a good spend of my time? Those are a lot of things that, that I hear coming up from folks. So what's your advice for the best approach to integrating technology for those in the industry that are yet to make a start? Absolutely. Partnering with a solutions provider that can offer both technology and professional services to support the integration of it. Kind of going back to the question that was just asked, a big hesitancy in moving towards new technology is I don't want to spend a lot of time figuring this out and working on what I'm already working on. But if you employ a partner, a technology partner, they are going to lay out an amazing implementation plan for you step by step. And that's going to not feel like any work at all for you because you're going to have somebody there essentially holding your hand and making sure that implementation is successful throughout bringing on a new solution. You're also going to want to look for a provider that has a proven record of accomplishment across the industry and with a breadth of depth and experience. We don't want to bring someone on that doesn't know what they're doing in the realm that you're working on because again, you want to make this process as easy as possible for you. And also an in-house team to support that integration and help identify workflow processes for smooth implementation is great. You want folks in your organization to be on your side. So this is not an uphill battle that one person has to carry. I have seen that sometimes where one person is really invested in a new process or a solution and others aren't. And it's a really hard push for that person. With an increased focus on sustainability across the industry, you want to bring on a partner provider that helps to understand the role of digitization in supporting sustainability outcomes. Doing that can really help provide your organization with making the steps that you're looking to make to just have more succinct workflows. So when you consider your time in the industry and the changes you have already seen and you think future in terms of technology, what is it that excites you the most? Honestly, I'm really excited to see people get to do the work that they want to do. I have worked with so many people that are just frustrated with the back and forth that they have to do, with the unnecessary headaches that they have to put up with, really just in terms of not having updated and relevant information on the field to, to do the project. I know that the folks that go into construction and design and engineering are so passionate about that space. And that they're there because they want to make a difference. I'm excited for the future in watching the mitigations of, of just kind of the day-to-day -day frustrations that they see fade away so that they can show up every day and have the passion that they want to have um, in their job. There's so much creative projects that are happening. The world is, is incredible. And with the software available, people are able to design just the most amazing things. And I'm so excited to see what we continue to create, You know what these brilliant folks in construction are able to do. Well, Lisa, it's certainly been great to have you on the program and to hear the insights that you've been able to share on the industry and definitely to hear your passion for the industry. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much. Are you looking for a digitalization and net zero partner to help you achieve your goals? Join the thousands of AEC and manufacturing customers globally who have turned to VinZero to start their journey toward a net zero future. With 32 offices around the world, VinZero can connect you to the right technologies and workflow processes, so you can maintain your competitive position and increase profitability. VinZero has an industry expert to help you navigate the best pathway forward wherever you are on your digitalization and net zero journey. Visit binzero.com to find out more. Based in the United Arab Emirates, NTD Paints has innovated the paint industry by introducing the world's only safe substitute for titanium dioxide. 
and in doing so, they're changing the global paint industry with the most sustainable solution. It's high in performance, toxic free, and it's certainly changing the way we see paint. We're joined today by Peter DeMarca. Welcome to the program, Peter. Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. The history behind NTD Paints is very interesting. It started almost by accident in a way, didn't it? And I'd love you to share with us a bit about that story with our listeners. It actually started when the founder was working at a shipping port and he would constantly receive shipments containing barrels of paint. Once in a while, some of the barrels were not packaged correctly uh, and they would fall uh, off of the pallets and split on the docks. Uh, And when this would happen, the whole port would smell of fumes and there'd be a lot of waste. and, And this got the thought process started of how can we reduce this waste and the toxic smell and the effects it has on the people working with these products and make it less impactful to the environment? You know, there must be a better way was the real question behind it. And this is where the initial IP came from. And fast forward since then, and we actually have a startup now in Dubai, the United Arab Emirates, uh, and we're currently serving the African, uh, Middle Eastern and Asian paint market uh, and industries. So what is it, Peter, that makes this paint so safe? There are a few aspects to to why our paint is so safe Um, and actually a lot healthier to use as well than traditional paints. Um, And one of the first ones is is that we produce our paint and our product without any pesticides. Uh, So pesticides or biocides are, uh, are actually used as preservatives in paint to extend the lifetime and life period of, uh, of a product. Um, and, and along with that, we also produce our paint and our product without any VOCs or volatile organic compounds. Um, and VOCs are actually what gives paint that toxic smell or the, those fumes uh, which you get when you open a can or a bucket of paint or when you're painting a, a room. Um, But I think most importantly, what makes our paint so safe is that uh, our product does not contain any titanium dioxide. Um, And what titanium dioxide is, or TiO2 in in chemical form, it's a suspect carcinogen, uh, which is used as the white pigment in paint, but also in food and in uh, child's toys. Uh, So many, many things. Um, And TiO2 has actually been classified uh, and banned uh, by the EU and the state of California uh, in the United States. Um, And many other countries are joining this change to ban TiO2. We had last week or at the beginning of July, we had Saudi Arabia joining the ban on on TiO2 in food products, and they'll be moving to to paint as well. Um, And many Asian countries and African countries are also looking into this, uh, this change and, and this ban of TiO2. So it's a, it's a very hot topic at the moment. Uh, and that's actually where our name comes from, NTD. Uh, so the NTD stands for No Titanium Dioxide Paints. So that's a great background. So what sort of problems is NTD paint solving? Well, we solve a lot of problems. Uh, we solve very reoccurring issues in the industry. Um, And that's actually one of the main reasons why we're located in the UAE Uh, is because the climate in Africa, Asia and the Middle East are some of the most challenging for paint durability. Um, We constantly see exterior walls with chipped paint or paint that's peeling off of the wall because of the heat and the humidity levels. Um, So even this, you know, paint falling off a wall is an enormous health hazard because paint contains small plastic particles, which when it has fallen off a wall, it can be swept into our water reservoir and end up in our drinking water. Um, So, you know, having said that, our our paint is formulated in a way that it bonds properly to these moist surfaces and in high humidity areas. Uh, And we've developed a, a trait in which our paint allows humidity and the dampness that is created between the wall and the layer of paint to escape from behind that layer of paint. Um, And this is a process that we call uh, airing. And it's a term that makes our paint vapor permeable. So, you know, by having this, 
you'll not have to constantly repaint your walls yearly or biannually, um, which can be an, a huge headache, of course, and also very costly. And on top of that, because our product is, is produced without the titanium dioxide or TiO2, and it is in a white color, the UV resistance trait that it has is, is excellent. And having removed um, titanium dioxide from the equation, from the formula, uh, our product actually absorbs heat and, and reflects sunlight, uh, making it incredibly efficient for tackling heat stress. Um, and the last problem uh, to add to the list of, of, uh, of these reoccurring issues is that, you know, we drastically reduce the amount of waste uh, which is left over uh, after painting a wall or, or a project uh, compared to the amount of waste that can sometimes be created when using these traditional paints. So, you know, there are multiple issues and problems which our paint solves. So let's talk about the no titanium dioxide because there's one very unusual factor about your paint, isn't there? Uh, yes, there is. There is one very unusual factor is, is that we actually produce, package and transport um, NTD White 3, which is the name of our product, um, in the form of powder. This is one of the main reasons why we can reduce waste so drastically and why we don't have any pesticides or biocides or volatile organic compounds, those VOCs, which I mentioned before. Um, and, you know, the name of the product says it all as well, which is that we currently only produce a white color uh, because of the incredible developments uh, with not having any titanium dioxide and being able to package it in the form of powder. So as a totally white and an only white paint, does that have any limitations? Not any limitations. It has a lot of advantages because it is only produced in the white color. Uh, the UV resistance traits uh, are very good because we are producing without any titanium dioxide. The paint has the ability to uh, absorb heat and reflect light, which for those that have solar panels, which is becoming an, a, a huge trend at the moment as well. Um, we have the ability to optimize the solar panel efficiency because of the reflection of sunlight. Um, so there are actually multiple benefits uh, because we're only producing in a white color. So given that it's only available in white at the moment, are there any future plans to look at introducing colors into the range? We... Uh, currently only produce our product and our product is only available in, in the color white. Uh, but when you really observe your surroundings and pay attention to the number of, of white houses or buildings or uh, white walls inside a home, you really get an idea of how large this market is and can be. Um, we do have a team that is dedicated to the development of the product. Um, they are looking at different options and ways in which we uh, will be able and may be able to uh, introduce different color options in the future. Uh, but this will only be done if the core product, so our, our white pigment, is, is not compromised of its quality. Well, that makes a lot of sense. So from a practical perspective, what is it actually like to use your paint if it's shipped and sent and you receive it in powder? Of course. Well, this is a question that we are asked quite often when telling people that we produce paint in the form of powder. Um, but the product is simple to use uh, as you only need to add the correct amount of water and, and mix it with the powder. And interestingly enough, when we look at traditional paints, which are packaged in a can or a bucket, they're packaged as something that we call a base paint, uh, meaning that uh, the liquid inside is quite thick um, and this is done because one of the first things that professional painters do when they buy paint and start using this paint is they add water themselves to thin the paint to their liking. So the same process is, is actually done with NTD paints. It's just that more water is needed for NTD White 3 because it starts off in the form of powder. To actually use the paint um, is, is the same as any other paint. The coverage is, is incredible and the paint, in fact, is as good as any other quality paint that you can find on the market currently. And uh, it's just that ours is 
better for the environment. It's it's safe and it's it's a lot healthier to use as well. And along with that, it's easy to store the product. Um, I said before that we drastically reduce uh, the amount of waste, and this is actually because you know users can mix the amount of paint that is needed. So whatever is left over can be stored on the shelf or can be put back in the garage and. It can be used for another project in a year or or in two years. So if it's mixed with water, is it a water-based paint and do you wash up in water? Correct. So uh, it's it's a two-component uh, paint. So it's water-based and, and you can wash up on water as well, correct. What was behind the decision to invest in a sustainable paint alternative? Well, you know, paint is always on the bottom of the checklist, um, in the planning and the construction phase. Um, and it's also on the bottom of the checklist when looking at solutions to tackle climate change. But why? You know, we, we see sky high temperatures in Europe uh, this summer, uh, which is something that wasn't expected until around 2050, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and I know that we can make a drastic difference just by changing the way that the paint industry currently functions. You know, we see on average that 10% of paint that is produced globally, it, it goes to waste. You know, that, that's 10% on average, uh, which is almost a billion gallons of paint a year. And that has to change. So to really answer your question of why the decision to invest in a sustainable alternative, well, that's why, you know, we can make a huge difference by just changing one industry. What are some of the interesting facts that you can share about other types of paints? Well, there's actually two interesting factors uh, or points which I which I always compare, and the first one being that with almost all traditional paints, so paints that are packaged in a in a can or a bucket, um, you'll you'll need a complementary product such as a primer or a top coat, uh, meaning that you have to buy at least two products, uh, and you'll need extra time to apply more coats and layers, and with NTD paints. Uh, the product is an all-in-one. Uh, for most surfaces, a primer is not needed. Uh, and the product can be used for both interior and exterior walls, You know, making it much more cost-effective as well as you don't need to buy uh, an interior paint, an exterior paint, and then a primer and a top coat, and, and etc. Uh, and secondly, and I think most interesting and important of all, is that all other paints have titanium dioxide. Um, and we're actually the only ones in the world that have developed a substitute for TiO2, which is safe and just as white. Well, certainly the fact that you have no titanium dioxide seems to be very compelling. So who are your typical customers? Well, technically, I mean, every person who lives in a house or works in an office uh, are our customers. Uh, but we are currently really focusing on the business to business side. Uh, and more specifically speaking, the contractors, the building consultants, uh, and also the, the green certification companies. Um, so really those who are the decision maker when it comes to paint for, for uh, specific projects. You know, those are our typical, typical customers. And of course, this differs per region, uh, who the decision maker is. Um, and alongside that, we are actively looking for distributors in different countries as well. You know, these are the people or the companies that have the knowledge and the experience of the local market and region. What do your customers say about NTD paints when they've used it? I think that the most interesting feedback is that painters are uh, saying that they're feeling better, that they're sleeping better. You know, they're not tired after using the product, uh, which they usually would be. Um, and this is because there's no toxic fumes, which painters have to work with all day. The health benefits are so incredible to see and hear from these professionals. And, and these are the people who are constantly struggling with health issues due to their work. So to provide them with uh, a healthier solution um, is, is great feedback, of course. And it's, uh, it's very interesting because, you know, painters typically have their fixed discounts at their local stores that they constantly revisit and they're willing to let that go and step towards a healthier product uh, because they're feeling so much better. And, and they do see that the, 
that the quality of the paint is uh, the same, if not better, than the paint that they're currently using. Well, that's certainly encouraging for NTD paint. So as we come to the end of our time together on our Think Future podcast, can I ask you, when you think about the future of NTD paints, what is it that excites you the most? That's a good question uh, and also a, a difficult question. I think for me, and, and as I said before, uh, paint is, is the last on the checklist in the planning, but also in the environmental aspect. And being able to provide that solution with such an amazing product, I think that's very exciting. Of course, the, the story behind NTD Paints is wonderful and the product is incredibly sustainable, but we actually solve multiple issues in the industry and the quality of the paint is phenomenal. Uh, so that's what excites me the most, you know, to, to be able to make that change and have a proper change in the world. Certainly something to be excited about. Peter, we very much look forward to hearing about your journey and the success of NTD Paints and the growth and look forward to speaking with you perhaps in the future as the product continues to develop. Uh, definitely. Well, thank you very much for having me today. It's been a, it's been a real pleasure to be here and uh, I hope to speak to you as well in the future. This podcast was brought to you by VinZero. VinZero helped the AEC and manufacturing industries keep pace with digital change and achieve their technological and sustainability leadership goals. VinZero is a company that cares about creating and building a better world. Together, we are working with industry and environmental experts, providing forums and platforms through our VinZero Think community to create conversations that matter to our future generations. We invite you to join in the conversation and participate in our Think community. Like and subscribe to Think Future to stay up to date with the latest innovations and conversations as we take AEC and manufacturing around the world closer to zero. You can download our podcasts at vinzero.com or from your favourite podcast platform. From Vinzero Think Future, thanks for listening.